I'm Kelly. I'm Aaron. And I'm Brian. Welcome back. Today, we're going to be taking a close look at one of our wrought iron swivel guns. So here we have one of the foundation's examples of a wrought iron gun, in this case a swivel gun, uh, referring to the fact that it's mounted on a swivel on a pintle so that it can be easily directed wherever it needs to be fired. We see these commonly referred to as rail guns as they'll be found mounted on the rails of ships as this one is. Wall guns, they're commonly mounted on the walls of forts. Uh, we see a number of other uh, names being used, uh, including murderers. Uh, as we'll get into it, this is most efficiently an anti-personnel weapon. And uh, we, we see these made in a variety of, uh, of materials. The wrought iron gun uh, is specifically what we want to look at today. Very commonly, when we look at historical artillery, we tend to see cast bronze, cast brass, and that is very common in this time period, but it's also very expensive. So there's always a desire to be able to use a less expensive material, being iron, to try to make that same gun. Casting iron is a very comparatively recent technology, uh, and we don't really start seeing successful cast iron guns in England, for instance, until the middle of the 1500s. And so we see a lot of earlier examples of wrought iron guns, guns that have been stave built, they've been banded, uh, be building this gun up out of much smaller pieces, hand put together, uh, and uh, most commonly, these wrought iron guns are going to be breech loading like the one we have here today, uh, which has its own pros and cons. Now, of course, having a much less expensive artillery piece to begin with as compared to a bronze gun is going to be a plus. Uh, and then having that breech loading system, which again is a lot of, uh, a lot of times something that folks that are uh, you know, into historical artillery are surprised by. We don't tend to think of breech loading gunpowder weapons as being particularly early, but they are very common, again, in the, in the 16th century with these wrought iron guns. And uh, with this particular instance, what we've got is a removable breech chamber that will fit into that open cradle, fixed in place by that uh, iron wedge there, which again, we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment. And that breech chamber, uh, of course, makes it very rapid to reload. You're avoiding the issues of have, having to clean out the, uh, the, the, the hazards left behind by the previous shot as the breech is actually being removed from the gun. Any, pre any, any hazard left over from the previous shot is being removed from the gun and a whole nother breech being introduced. Uh, so quicker in that regard. However, that breech chamber also fails to seal perfectly with the back of the barrel. So we lose some gas pressure there uh, at the shot. So faster to reload but not quite as good range or hitting power as compared to a muzzle-loading gun, which is why we're never going to see any one of these designs become a standard. We see a mix all across the board. Um, the, uh, the wrought iron guns, again, are going to be uh, the primary advantages. Again, they're, they're cheaper and, to a certain extent, easier to make. You don't have to have a foundry to build them. Uh, and for the Virginia Company, expense is definitely going to be a major concern. And we end up seeing, in particular, with this gun, uh, Captain John Smith placing th an order for three dozen of them for the colony, which is one of the reasons why uh, we like this gun here at the museum. It's not just a cool gun in that it's forged. It's not just a cool gun in that it's breech loading, uh, but it's also cool that it was uh, considered to be very central and very necessary for the defense of the colony uh, by none other than Captain John Smith. So, without further ado, Let's get into the operation of the gun itself. All right, so now we're gonna take a uh, closer look at the gun itself, the, its actual operation, and go through the process. By the manual, there is no actual manual for this gun, but we're gonna go through step-by-step, step, sort of order by order, as to how this gun operates. And that is gonna start with the order, order the piece to load, which is simply Hi. saying, make sure the gun is operational and get it ready to work then handle the charge. So that preloaded breech chamber kept off to the side is gonna be pulled forward and charged the piece, placed into the breech and seated properly. And a big iron wedge is gonna be put through behind that chamber, locking it in place, essentially turning the, the breech and gun now into one solid piece. Pick and prime, a brass pick is gonna be used to go down through the, the vent hole at which 
point all of this is going to be ignited to break open the charge inside of that chamber whether you're looking at these removable reach chambers uh, or the muzzle loading guns themselves typically a canvas bag charge used to kind of pre-measure powder uh, to, to speed the, uh, the the loading process and so that pick is break, broken open that bag and then a flask of priming powder used to fill that vent hole connect that charge to the outside of the gun and give you something to then ignite uh, and of course none of these guns this early are going to have their own ignition system and uh, so we're going to be using slow match uh, much like you'll have seen with the Maxlock muskets, but attached to a tool called a limb stock uh, to uh, ignite that priming powder. Now the command will be given gauge the piece, so simply aiming it at what you want to hit. And with a gun like this, primarily loaded with anti-personnel ammunition, this is point blank operation. This is not a uh, not a, a, a gun that requires a lot of math to be done first to uh, prepare it, so it's point and shoot. And now that it is uh, prepared, the next command will essentially be the firing command. Get fire! Secure the piece! This final con command essentially removing that breech chamber and preparing the gun to be loaded again.
This would be typical of the anti-personnel ammunition available in the early 17th century. Uh, and again, what most commonly you'll see the swivel guns meant to fire. And this is simply what's referred to as case shot. And in this case, it's loaded with pistol bullets. It's a, uh, it, in this particular example, smaller example, two hollowed out halves. We also see in larger guns, them stave built, almost like a barrel, but a wooden can. Like I said, this one loaded with pistol shot, pistol and musket shots, what we see most commonly, but you'll, you'll see all sorts of things. Uh, and it's simply held together uh, with string, sometimes wax and string, but essentially designed to disintegrate when that gun goes off so that everything that's loaded into that case just comes spraying out of there like a giant shotgun blast. Very effective, but only at very close range. Well, we hope you liked this installment, and if so, remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below.